All right, good morning. Man, thank you, worship team. I, I really appreciate singing with you all. I, I really look forward to Sundays. I really do. Uh, sometimes I got to work on Sundays, and uh, it's, it's a bummer, because I love to be here with you guys and sing and worship God. It, it's just uh, refreshing to my soul. Um, today, we're going to speak on, or I'm going to speak on, uh, Tested Faith. Uh, we're closing up the series on Abraham, the heroes of the faith. Let me just check this, see if this works. Is it on? Okay. So the title of my message is Tested Faith, Genesis 22. Before I get into the message, I'm going to start off with a pop quiz. Oh, man, Christian, why do you got to be like this, right? I know, this is a teacher in me, okay? So we, we went through the first uh, three weeks talking about Abraham. I've only got five questions for you. Five questions. So if you miss one, I'll say you still get an A, okay? I'm gracious that way, okay? If you miss two, you get a B. If, I, if you miss three, C, four, D, five, you're probably sleeping in church, I think, you know? I don't know what's going on there. I'm just kidding. Hopefully you don't miss any. So this is uh, going with our series that we've heard so far. So uh, going to the first uh, message that we heard by Peter. What does Abram's name mean? Now whisper to your part or the person sitting next to you, say, okay, which one is it, okay? So you got uh, some options there. A, laughter. B, exalted father. C, father of many. D, Father of the righteous. Which one is it? Okay, so the answer is, all right, I'm going to put my brother on the spot here, okay? Yeah, he was always good in school? No. All right, Justin, what is it? Um, I, uh, can I get a lifeline? Okay, sure, sure. <laughs> my brother needs a lifeline. Something's never changed here. Okay, Justin, who's your lifeline? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll actually ask the audience. Oh, my word. <laughs> Okay, let's go. Okay, let's pick on my dad. Jim. Okay, good job. Exalted father. Yay, okay. Okay, exalted father. Okay, whose name means laughter? Isaac, right? Whose name means father of many? Abraham, right? Abraham. I know, it's tricky. Okay, okay. Now you guys are awake. But guess what? If you miss one, you still get an A, okay? You still get a sticker at the end of the day, right? <coughs> okay. B, what was it that Abraham struggled with that often caused him to sin? This is going back to Peter's first message. What was it that Abraham struggled with that often caused him to sin? Whisper to your, your partner, whisper to the person next to you. What is it? Okay, okay. Okay, Justin, coming back to you. <laughs> Time to redeem yourself. Um, uh, I think I'm going to go with letter, <laughs> letter D. Okay, good. D, letter D. That's right. Fear, right? Often, uh, Abraham was afraid, which led him into sin, right? Okay, next question. Number three. What is the name of the king whom Abraham gave a tenth of his spoils to? This is, again, going back to Peter's message. Whisper to your partner, what is the name of the king? Ooh, some of you are like, this one's hard. Christian, what's going on? Come on, where are you paying to think back? You guys, you can look at your notes. This is open note quiz. This is free, okay? The answer is, okay, Robert, do you know this one? Yes, you are correct. It is Melchizedek. That is right, Melchizedek. Okay, number four, I'm going to ask you the question because uh, I, I think my answer is up there already, okay? So here, just listen. Okay, the question is, in Genesis 15, God put Abram to sleep and walked between uh, the animal pieces by himself. If you remember, Abraham cut up these animals, divided them in half, and then God puts him to sleep. And while Abram's asleep, God passes through the animals, right? Kind of saying, hey, this, this promise is guaranteed by me, right? 
Now, when God passes through the animals, what does God appear as? Do you remember? Here's some options. A, a smoking fire pot and flaming torch. B, an angel with a sword. C, a mighty wind. Or D, a chariot of fire. Does anyone remember? Okay, talk to your, talk to your partner, figure out which one was it. Let me remind you. A, a smoking fire pot and flaming torch. B, an angel with a sword. C, a mighty wind. D, a chariot of fire. Yeah, that's right. You can't look in the back. If you look in the back, you know my answer, okay? It is A, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch. If you remember um, Peter's message, he said, do you remember that God appeared uh, to the Israelites as a cloud and then as a, uh, a, a fire, right? A column of fire, right? And he used that to uh, kind of show some uh, similarities here. Okay, last question. Hopefully you guys are still good students. B, A range, right? Maybe. Last question. What was the name of Abram's child with Sarah's handmaid, Hagar? Now this goes to uh, Robert's message. Do you remember? Okay, whisper to your partner. A, Ishmael. B, Israel. C, Judah. D, Isaac. All right. Let's go to the second smartest person in class, right, Steve? I like to phone a friend. Yeah, exactly. Oh, no. Well, now we got big problems. <laughs> and I defer to my son, Ethan. He's going to answer this one. He wants a lifeline. Okay, that's a lifeline. Yep. What? You are correct, Ishmael. Good job. Good job. All right. You, you spared your dad there. Good job. Okay. Now some follow-up questions. Questions, they don't count for a quiz, but just to introduce what we're going to talk about today. Um, this topic, uh, tested faith. Question for you. Have you ever felt like God wasn't making sense? Hmm. Have you ever felt like the things he does, it's like, why, why are you doing that? You question his timing, his ways, his purpose. What is this God? I actually preached this message like uh, six years ago. And um, Peter asked me to preach this message again. And then we'll talk about that in the end. But six years ago, uh, my wife and I were in the middle of a move. And I was going to move to, um, to Atlanta to become a youth pastor there. And they left it open. They said, preach whatever you want. Uh, and I was like, man, when you leave it open like that, it's difficult. But uh, what I do is I say, okay, if it's wide open, I'm going to preach what God is teaching me at the moment. And so he brought me to this passage. Uh, at that time, my sister just found out she had cancer. Uh, my dad had too many strokes. And we were going through a really unsure time. This was me. <laughs> God, what are you doing? This does not make sense. Whew. See, every time I preach, I'm like tearing up. I'm trying not to, guys, I promise. <laughs> but we're going to look at God's word. And we're going to draw comfort and strength from who God is today, right? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for who you are. God is true. Sometimes we don't understand. God, we struggle. But but you are God. And we can rest in you. God, you are faithful. God, you love us more than we could imagine. God, you are good. 
remind us today of who you are. Lord, hide me behind the cross, God. It's not me. It's your word. It's who you are. God, use my feeble attempt at presenting and speak. I pray hearts would be open and tender towards you. In your name I pray. Amen. Sorry. Okay. Let's look at, if you have your Bibles, open up to Genesis chapter 22. And let's look at this. Tested faith. Okay, tested faith. Genesis chapter 22. And I'm going to open my Bibles there as well, even though I have it on my, uh, my notes here. Genesis chapter 22. Okay. It starts off with a shocking request. God is asking for a sacrifice. This is a shocking request, and here's why. Let's look at the passage. Verse 1, it says, After these things, God tested Abraham. Now remember, this is part four of our series. This is the end of Abraham's life, right? God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering and on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. All right. So if you remember, in the beginning of Abraham's life, Genesis chapter, uh, I think it was 11 or 12, God told Abraham to go, right? God says, go to the land that I will give you, Abraham. And now again, God is telling Abraham to go. But this time he's saying, go to offer your son as a sacrifice. What a shocking request, isn't it? What? Well, are you sure? Okay, Here, here's something that you gotta think about as well. Um, when I was at seminary, I was, uh, you, you read a lot of different views. You read all about uh, opposing views to Christianity as well. Uh, one of the guys I was reading, his name is Bart Herman. He used to be a pastor, very, very smart, intelligent guy, uh, struggled with suffering and why God allows it, and he ends up becoming an agnostic scholar opposed to Christianity. And he writes all these books against Christianity. And so, of course, I'm, I'm I'm reading this guy thinking, man, um, what happened here, right? In one of his books, he writes this about this topic. He says, the God who had promised Abraham a son now wants him to destroy that son. The God who commands his people not to murder has now ordered the father of the Jews to sacrifice his own son. If someone were to come to you and say, oh, you're a Christian, oh, really, what about this passage where God tells Abraham to sacrifice his own son. Doesn't that go against God's command? How do you answer that? Oh. Um, well, there's, there's a couple of things we got to look at, right? One is the immediate context, what God is uh, doing in this passage, and then also um, the context leading up to that, how we got to this point. But you do have to say, like, it, it is a, a shocking request, right? I mean, let's say Willie said, came to me and said, hey, Christian, uh, God told me to sacrifice Lorelai. We would be like, uh, Willie, you're crazy, right? If you had said Trey, we would have been okay and said, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I like to pick on Trey. But it is a, a shocking request. So let, let's look at it. Um, first of all, here's how we answer that question a little bit, the, the immediate context. In verse 1, remember it says this, After these things God tested Abraham. The reader knows, God knows, but Abraham doesn't know that this is a test, right? Right? This is a test. God tested Abraham. A test of what? We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, verse 2, or end of verse 1, he said, Abraham, and he said, here am I, take your son. Now, here's something that's very, very interesting. 
He says, your only son, Isaac. In the King James Version, I think it says, take now thy son. Um, if, you, if you look in the Hebrew, there's actually this, um, this little particle there, na, right? And that's where uh, the King James is translating it as now. Um, another word to translate that particle is do come in or just listen to me. But it can also be translated as please. Uh, Paul Copen in his book is God a Moral Monster. He says this, God is remarkably gentle as he gives this difficult order. This type of divine command as a plea is rare. Old Testament commentator Gordon Wenham sees here a hint that the Lord appreciates the costliness of what he is asking for. He is not taking this lightly. He is saying, Abraham, will you please take your son and do this? Do you see, God is not being harsh <laughs> with Abraham, but he is actually very loving in his approach. This is costly, I know. Abraham, would you please do this? This is quite fascinating, right? Abraham could have argued with God and said, what, you get out of here, but he doesn't. What happens next? Before we keep going in our, our story, I want us to look at the relationship between God and Abraham to answer this question, to see it more fully, why, why Abraham doesn't just say, you know what, I don't care what you say, God, why, why Abraham doesn't buck against God's command. Let's look at God's relationship with Abraham from the very beginning, okay? From the very beginning, God tells Abram, and at first his name was Abram, but God changes his name. And he talks about Sarai, his wife. Look at the description. The Bible, when it gives descriptions about people, it's very important, right? The description for Sarai is this. She's barren and has no child. What a description, right? This is how your God is introducing you in the Bible. You're barren. That's pretty important, isn't it? Let's keep going in our, our story. Obviously, Abraham and Sarah don't have any kids of their own, but God makes this awesome promise. He says to Abraham, he says, go to your country and leave your, leave your family, and guess what? Man, I'm going to give you, uh, or I will make of you a great nation. You see God's promise? You have no children, but I'm going to make a great nation out of you, Abram. Wow. What happens next? As we read the story, when I was a youth pastor, I used to illustrate um, the stories because the kids liked, you know, illustrations. So help some of your kids today, right? So enjoy this here. Um, so if we look at Genesis 12, Eve, after God gives this promise to Abram, what does Abram do? A few verses later, Abram is in Egypt, and man, Sarai is very pretty. And he knows that, oh man, these people might attack me, so he lies about Sarai. But remember, God made this promise already to him that I'm going to make a great nation out of him. But he's, he's fearful, and he lies about it. And then we go on to chapter 15. I'm skipping over the parts with a lot because I'm kind of focusing on Abram and God here. God reassures Abram. He says, hey, look out at the sky. Look at the stars, Abram. Fear not. I am your great reward, your shield. You know what? I'm going to come through for you, Abram. Don't fear. And then God does this. Remember what we talked about um, uh, Abram cuts these animals, puts them in half. It's, it's a covenant agreement between you and someone. If I break this covenant, what happens to these dead animals may it happen to me as well. But Abram never goes through that, the dead animals. What goes through? Instead, it's the smoking fire pot, flaming torch that goes through. God himself goes through that covenant, not Abram. You know what God's saying? This will happen based on my character, myself, I'm going to go through it. Not you, Abram. This is not based on you, right? It's based on God and his word. And so what happens next? Genesis 16. 
Sarah and Abraham come up with this idea to have a child of their own through the handmaid, Hagar. And then they have Ishmael. You're like, oh, Abraham, think about what God, God has been promising you all this time, right? And then in Genesis 20, I'm sorry, in Genesis 17, God comes before Abraham and reminds him again and says, hey, you're 99 years old, but guess what? You're going to have a son next year. Ha. Chapter 17, verse 17 says that Abraham laughed. He fell on his face before God and he laughed. How could this be? Sarah, when she's this old, is she still going to have kids? And then remember the three men visit um, their tent. And sure enough, same thing. Sarah laughs because she said, how can this happen? There's no way. But then just as God had said the very next year, what happens? The Lord visited Sarah as, this is what the Bible says, as God had said. Do you see how God has been faithful through his word this whole time? How's Abraham been? Fear, faith, fear, faith, fear, faith, right? But God is faithful. Do you know what? God is faithful to you, Christian. But I don't understand this. Yeah, I know. God's still faithful. He's faithful to keep his promises, right? Um, Peter quoted that verse. Um, All the promises of, of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Come back to his word. Hold fast to what God says. If God says this, he's going to come through, right? Here's what we see. Nothing can stop God's promises from being fulfilled. Not even Abraham's failure nor earthly kings. God is faithful to his word. And Abraham knows that. So when God is telling Abraham, go offer your son as a sacrifice, you know what Abraham thinks? Okay, I will offer my son, but God is faithful to his word. He has not let me down. And this son was the son of promise all this time. And so Abraham knew. What what do we see in the next verse? Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, he said. And he says, here, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? As as Abraham is taking his son to offer um, his son as a sacrifice, he actually tells the servants, wait here while, until we come back, both of us come back. And then in Hebrews, we're told that uh, Abraham believed that God would be willing to raise Isaac up somehow. So even though he's going to offer his son as a sacrifice, Abraham knows that God has been faithful this whole time. And he's going to do something, right? Even though this task is so difficult for Abraham. And so Abraham... Uh, Sorry, let me find myself here. Abraham is going up to the mountain with his son Isaac. And Isaac's looking around, where's this sacrifice, Dad? What does Abraham respond? He said, God will will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And I put that in bold because that statement right there uh, sums up the gospel, doesn't it? God will provide himself a lamb. We're going to look at that at the end. Can you imagine what this walk is like for Abraham as he's going up the mountain with his son? What is he thinking? What is he feeling? What are some verses that you guys cling to when you're going through trials? Do you guys have any that pop up in your head? When you're going through a trial in your life, what are some verses that are like, ah, This verse is an anchor to my soul right now. I'm kind of putting you guys on the spot. No pressure. Do any of you have one that you could think of? What? Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I have that verse down here as well. I was going to share that. Thank you. No, I'm glad. I'm glad you did. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Anyone else? That's right. 
whether I have lot or little, I could do all things through Christ. What about songs? Are there worship songs that you listen to that kind of help you through your walk up the mountain? I think we sang one today for me, Lord, I need you. I didn't tell Nick about that one, but I actually wrote that in my sermon. Keep me in the shelter of your wings. You say. It's a good one. I have here uh, Blessings by Laura Story. Have you heard that one? It says, we pray for blessings. We pray for peace, comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while, you hear each spoken need. Yet love is way too much to give us lesser things. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if healing comes through tears? <sighs> what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know that you are near? Another song, uh, You Will Hold Me Fast by Keith and Christian Getty. Have you heard that one? When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold on life's fearful path. For my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. Guys, I, I just want to encourage you. During your walks up the mountain, cling to Christ. It's difficult. It's hard. I don't understand, right? Just as even Isaac probably at that point wasn't understanding and Abraham not fully understanding. His gracious provi provision. Let's keep reading. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Um, I was looking up uh, paintings by, you know, uh, classic paintings um, by all these artists who back in the day, they would paint these biblical pictures, right? And I was going to share some of them, but I'm like, oh man, this one's cool, this one's cool. But instead of uh, showing you a picture, I, I want you to imagine, if, if you were the painter, how would you paint it? How would you paint Abraham's face as he's about to offer his son Isaac, his only son whom he loves? How would you paint his grip on his knife? How would you paint his stance? How would you paint Isaac's face as he's about to see what is going on here? You can only imagine how Abraham is feeling at this point, right? Here he is, he takes his knife and he's about to sacrifice his son, his only son. God, you promised his son, I don't understand, but this is what you want. What happens? Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife to slaughter his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Do not lay your hand on the boy. Do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. What a scene. Abraham, he went and he looked up and he sees a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Abraham took the ram and offered that instead as a burnt offering. So Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide, right? Jehovah Jireh. I looked up this word, Jehovah Jireh, and actually the root word of it, provide, yire, comes from this word in Hebrew, ra'ah, which is to see. This word is deeply meaningful. It's not that God will just give us the goods that we need but that actually God sees our need. He, he experiences it. He feels, he knows what you're going through right? It is deeply personal. God sees and experiences all this need of mine and makes pr provision for it. Um, some application. 
thinking about our Isaacs in our life whom you love. God points that out. This was not an easy task for Abraham. And um, uh, Peter asked me to preach on this topic um, a month or so ago back. And um, many of you know that my wife and I, we have similarities to Abraham and Sarah. We have wanted a child for so long. We have prayed for a child. And a few months ago, we were able to foster this baby girl that we did not intend to, we weren't even (laughs) signed up to be foster parents, right? But this need came up. And so my wife and I said, okay, we'll take her. Um, And I just want to commend you as a church. We are so thankful for you guys. We said, hey, in order for us to foster this this girl, it's going to take a church. And you guys have been so good to us. Uh, We feel the love, and she feels the love. Uh, But, uh, you know, to lay down your Isaac, I could see how parents could love a child so deeply. My wife and I would love to adopt this baby girl. But we don't, we don't know. We don't know. So we lay down our eyes and say, God, whatever you want. And it's a good thing, right? You're like, God, this is a good thing for us to adopt. Why not? But we don't know God's ways. And right there are some good things in your life that you're like, God, why this? Why not this? God, why am I going through that? But at the end of the day, we know God is faithful and God is loving. How do we know God is loving? Well, think about this. Let's think about the similarities here, okay? Um, sorry, before I... I move on to the similarities I, I forgot to mention. When, when dealing with our idols, things that we love, you know, when God deals with the idols in our life, we can either become bitter and angry and say, God, how dare you not let me have this? Or how dare you let me experience this? And you can reject God, run away from God. Or in this book by uh, Tim Keller, Counterfeit Gods, he writes this. Or else like Abraham, you could take walk up the mountains. You could say, I see that you may be calling me to live my life without something I never thought I could live without. But if I have you, I have the only wealth, health, love, honor, and security I really need and cannot lose. As many have learned and later taught, you don't realize Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Isn't that a good statement? Man, it's really tough to be a Christian, isn't it? Life is not always smooth sailing. But you know what God does through those trials and those storms? He's testing our faith and saying, cling to me. Know me through this, right? Let's look at some parallels real quick. Similarities between Isaac and Jesus. What are some, if you think about it, of course you you read this story about Abraham and Isaac and you cannot help but think of some similarities. One is this, Isaac was Abraham's only son of promise and Jesus is God's only son. Both Isaac and Jesus were subject to be sacrificed. And then just as Isaac willingly submitted to be a sacrifice on a mountain, Jesus willingly submitted to crucifixion on Calvary. But guess what? There is a difference, right, in the stories. What is that? When you think about the difference in the stories, unlike Isaac, who was spared from death, Jesus died on the cross and bore God's wrath for our sins. Just as that ram took the place of Isaac, Christ took the place for us. 
We are sinners deserving God's just wrath against sin, right? But Christ lived the life that we could not live, the perfect life, and willingly subjected himself to crucifixion. And God's wrath on him, willingly. I used to think in college, wow, what a death, that someone would just die that death for me. But it goes beyond just a physical death to experience God's wrath like that. How in the world, when I thought about the weight of that, I was like, wow, for me, I deserve that. I know my heart. I know how sinful I am. Christ did that for me? Yes. See, he loves you. So whatever you're going through right now, remember that God is faithful. God loves you, right? One last quote. God saw Abraham's sacrifice from Tim Keller again and said, now I know that you love me because you did not withhold your only son from me. That's what God said. But how much more can we look at his sacrifice on the cross and say to God, now we know that you love us for you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from us. What a truth. You know, I, I hope that as we look to Jesus and rejoice in what he did for us, that we will have the hope and joy necessary to get through these uh, ups and downs, these testings in our life. I don't know what you're going through today, but I pray that you would cling to God have him be the anchor of your soul. Remember his faithfulness. Look at his word. Repeat his truths in your heart. And man, plug into this group, this community. There, we've got some awesome people in this church. Some, not a lot. No, I'm just kidding. No, we have some awesome people who will care and love for you, who will pray for you, who will bear your burdens. Um, the, the worst thing you could do is kind of keep away. Right? As a church, we want to we want to build each other up. We want to feel the weight of what you're going through. We want to help you. All right. I hope uh, this was an encouragement to you. Let's pray today. Let's pray and then.